Hi, everybody. I really wish I could be there. I am thrilled um, to see a full room of humans. This is so much fun. And I wish I was there with you guys. I, I wanted to say I've been checking out the Twitter feed. So some fun pictures have come up, which is fantastic. So it looks like a great day yesterday. Um, keep keep all that stuff up. That all is super fun. So all right, without further ado, I'm Maggie Kelly. I'm a, a professor and cooperative extension specialist based at Berkeley, and I'm the director of the uh, UC a &R IGIS program. And I'm just a all around map technology um, lover. I've always been interested in maps, always loved making maps and working with spatial data. And so I'm thrilled to be here. Um, today. I wish I was there in person. But what I'm my role today is to set the stage, as Andy said, and talk about how all of these, uh, all of this comes together. And we're going to do that um, quite quickly. And, and we're going to talk about the drone products that we can make and how all how all of this comes together. So before I start, um, sound check, slide check, everything look good? Yes, we see and hear you, it all looks good. Good, okay. So what we're gonna do today, we're gonna talk about uh, some of the principles behind photogrammetry and what that means for drone data processing. And the uh, spoiler alert is it's mostly about image overlap. We're also gonna talk about some generic workflows, how we push the drone data that we collect through a pipeline to get all of these amazing products that many of you have, have mentioned or talked about already. And then we'll close with some practical aspects on um, you know, what sort of things do you need, um, computers, software, all that sort of stuff. But we'll start with the principles. So, We've, you've seen this a slide or several slides like this before from a collection of overlapping images collected by your drone at various heights, different cameras, different drones, but you're really collecting all of these overlapping images and you did it yesterday. Through this process, this workflow, you can get multiple products. You can get an ortho mosaic, which we just saw an example of before, from which you can if you have a multispectral camera, or sometimes even if you have a visible only an RGB camera, you can get some kind of spectral index. The beauty of this is you can also get this point cloud, which is like LIDAR, but not, but it's just from these overlapping images. You, could, you can also get a digital terrain model, a digital surface model, and this textured mesh. So from this humble beginning, just, just individual images, you can get all of these products repeatable through time. It's one of the real advantages of, of drones. And how do you do it? It's all based on principles of photogrammetry. And photogrammetry is a really old science. There was a patent in 1893 from a gentleman, Cornell Adams. And he uh, filed a patent that involved two balloons and two cameras used to make overlapping photographs, which, which then he proposed could be used to make measurements on the ground. And here's a quote from his um, patent. My invention has for its object to produce a method of obtaining aerial photographs in such a manner that the pictures obtained can be converted into topographical maps. So this was the real breakthrough. And so early photogrammetry that basically took up the, you know, the bulk of the 20th century was this highly controlled system where you had a camera on an aircraft, you knew all of the uh, parameters of that camera, you knew where the, the aircraft was. And if you took two photos that overlapped, a feature in those photos would appear slightly different. So here on this kind of sketch on the right, uh, this is from some of Caldwell's work, who if you guys are in remote sensing, you know that name. If you want to know the height of that tree, 
and you've taken a picture of it from you know camera at station one and camera at station two you can use something called stereo photogrammetry which basically takes advantage of what's called parallax because that tree is going to look slightly overlaid in one one camera and more overlaid in the other camera and if you take specific measurements of that tree its top its bottom and you fill it into this formula and you, you can calculate, because this tree has this apparent displacement in two different images, and you know all of the features about the camera, and you know where the camera was taken, you can, you can measure the height of that tree. And um, so this is what uh, traditional aerial photograph, aerial photography and photogrammetry made use of. This is the bulk of the 20th century, really. You take two overlapping images. So this example on the right, you create tie points, which are visual points. I know this lake, this little the corner of the lake or this particular sandbar. I see it in two pictures. I fill in all this information. What's my flying height? The photos have to be captured at NADAR, highly accurate locations of where the camera is, you know everything about the camera and you have a few parameters and you can say, all right, I know where this thing is. I can create a very accurate topographic map with X, Y, and Z locations for all of these points. But it did require that you had a lot of control. The camera, the flying height, a lot of this was done manually. And so what we're working with now is modern photogrammetry is really um, called structure from motion. That's, that's what we're gonna be talking about from, from here on out and probably through drone camp. And the idea is as long as you can see an object from multiple viewpoints in multiple overlapping images, you don't just have two or four or 10 of these tie points, you have massive numbers of these tie points. And if you have enough of them, you can kind of back calculate everything you need. And indeed, you can create the 3D structure of an object and really kind of recover all the details you need from, you know, maybe a much cheaper camera in this case. So structure for motion means that we can do all that work that we were doing with really highly precise calibrated cameras with consumer grade cameras, just because we flood it with data. This massive tie points is really the key. And this didn't get started with drone mapping. This got started really from um, machine learning and vision. And uh, I don't know about a lot of you, but during lockdown, a lot of um, us have been looking at things online. And one of the, the areas where this is, really advanced is in museum mapping and uh, you know uh, virtual visits of museums have taken advantage of the structure promotion you could go around this you know work of art and create it virtually and then texture mesh it and so we can fly into the museum and look at the stuff very cool but it's great for drone mapping too so this modern photogrammetry and structure for motion takes advantage of these machine uh, vision uh, workflows that require massive amounts of these tie points. And again, tie points are just a point that you can see in more than one image from a different vantage point. We can reconstruct that kind of consumer grade camera model and then create this X, Y, and Z location for almost all of the points in your particular image. So the point is that the structure for motion requires certain things and what it requires are these massive amounts of tie points. And so there are considerations for us as drone pilots because we wanna fly our missions to gather the, the, the kind of image overlap and the tie points that we're gonna need to do the structure for motion. So there's lots of, of um, aspects of mission planning that we need to think about. There's the camera shutter, 
And there's a couple of different, you can have rolling shutters or global shutters. Global shutter is best. There's also different cameras have different resolutions, which means they take pictures of the earth of either, you know, smaller extent or bigger extent. And so the more megapixels you have on your camera, the larger image extent, and that has some advantages because it covers a bigger footprint. I'm not gonna go into those two things in great detail unless they come up in the questions because the, the following three are really the really critical ones. We wanna talk about ground sample distance, ground control, and this you know, most important aspect, image overlap. So ground sample distance, we've mentioned this before this week several times. It's the distance between two consecutive pixel centers measured on the ground. In remote sensing terms, it's your image resolution. And so a larger ground sample distance, it's a bigger footprint, which is a lower spatial resolution, less detail. Smaller ground sample distance is the, is the opposite, smaller spatial resolution, more detail. And ground sample distance is just dependent on your camera and how high you're flying that camera above the ground. And it's a simple formula. Ground sample distance is equal to your flying height above the ground multiplied by the camera's pixel dimension divided by the camera's focal length. And there's lots of calculators out there. You can just Google them, you know, um, a UAV uh, ground sample distance calculator, and it'll, you know, for example, this is a Phantom 4, it's an older model now, but the ground sample distance, if you were flying a Phantom 4 at 100 meters above the ground, we already know what the camera's focal length is and the camera pixel dimensions. So if you were flying 100 meters above the ground, you'd be at about three centimeters ground sample distance. And the reason ground sample distance is so important is because you get to pick it. You get to decide what that's going to be because you control the flying height. And so um, this has been mentioned several times before this week, but you want to plan your ground sample distance so it's fit for purpose. Because while the smaller ground sample distance means you get more details, it does mean that there are some considerations in the photogrammetric process that you need to pay attention to. Because again, you're trying to get these tie points. And if you're so small, you're so fine in your ground sample distance, your tie point might be a blade of grass in this one that gets moved over with a little bit of wind in the next one. And so ground sample distance can complicate things. Ground sample distance um, will also uh, influence the size of your data set. So if you fly, for example, with a ground sample distance of one centimeter instead of three centimeters, you're going to be storing 10 times more data. So you really want to think about this and not think it's always, you know, I always want to get the finest spatial resolution I can because in the workflow, it can complicate things in the photogrammetric process and you'll find in the classification process later. So there are some rules of thumb aim for about three to 10 centimeters. But again, this is all for your purpose. It's fit, you know, if you actually are mapping features that are that small and you need to fly that low, then you need to do that. But just, you know, just be aware that a small ground sample distance is gonna give you more detail, means you're gonna fly lower, you're gonna fly more, you're gonna have massive data sets and longer processing times. A higher ground sample distance, a larger ground sample distance, less detail, you're flying higher, you're fly in the air less, your data sets are smaller, and your processing times are, are moderate. This is all you know, relative. But again, we've mentioned this before um, this week, it's all about trade-offs because you are controlling this. So you're gonna be thinking about how high do I wanna fly? How long am I gonna you know, have to, how many missions am I gonna have to fly to capture this? But important to think about as a rule of thumb, when you're thinking about how accurate can my uh, final product be, that you're gonna be able to get measurements of absolute location, which means really tied to the ground, different from relative location, which means all my, all my bits and bobs are lined up right. 
you're going to be able to get absolute location and an accuracy of about one to three times your ground sample distance. So if your ground sample distance is one centimeter, you're going to be about one to three centimeters absolute accuracy. If your ground sample distance is 10 centimeters, you're going to be about 10 to 30 centimeters absolute accuracy. Okay, so the next related issue is ground control. And we've talked about this um, throughout drone camp as well. So accurate ground control will help you get better absolute accuracy. And again, absolute accuracy is tied you know, to the earth. And the way to do this is to put out ground control points. These are easily identified targets on the ground that you've surveyed in with a high accuracy GPS. They can be temporary or they can be permanent. And you wanna think about using clear targets, high contrast. There's some examples on the right. You're gonna measure the center of your GCP. You're gonna evenly spread your GCPs through your map. And you're gonna make sure your GCPs are unobstructed and clearly visible in the imagery. If you decide to do this, there's a step in the workflow where that information gets pulled in to the overall processing. And now we get to the most important part, which is planning for overlap, because everything we do with photogrammetry or we call it structure for motion is based on, on image overlap. And image overlap means we can see the same features in multiple images and generate those massive number of tie points that we need to do this big brute kind of this brute photogrammetry process. And with drone imagery, because we're flying forward and we can fly back and forth, we can talk about overlap on the sides and overlap on the front. So side lap and, and front lap. And because everything we do is based on overlap, this is just repeating um, what I was saying before. If you have sort of weak overlap in the top picture, you're really only gonna generate a few points, but if you have bigger overlap, 75% overlap, you're gonna have more of these tie points and because everything we do requires massive number of, numbers of tie points. We've gotta maximize that overlap. And a rule of thumb from PIX4D is you need thousands of matched points per pair of images. And this usually requires something like 75% overlap. So this gets to mission planning. I know you guys spent a lot of time yesterday with mission planning and you, you know, the reason you do this is for safety and all these other reasons and convenience, but it's also to make sure that you're, you're, you're getting enough overlap so that you can run the, the overall photogrammetric workflow that we're going to talk about um, momentarily. So the best Flight plan is a grid pattern where you kind of go back and forth so that you can maximize that front overlap and that side overlap. And as our fearless leader, Sean said, when in doubt, increase your overlap and fly a bit higher. But there's lots of these mission planning apps out there to help you decide you know, how I wanna fly my particular study area. Okay, any questions before we get to the workflow? This was sort of just the kind of background. And I guess I can, Andy, you can field them to me if there are any, but if there aren't, we can, we can move on. Any questions? Yes, there's one. Go ahead. The question is which drones have a global shutter? Ah, good. So um, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but you should be able to get that in the specs. In general, the ones that we use for all of our kind of mapping work and research grade work have a global shutter. So um, one of you might be able to answer that. Probably the less expensive ones have rolling shutters. Any answers? Yeah, it'd probably be easy to say which ones have rolling shutters because, okay, Brandon shaking his head. So Brandon's saying in the DJI line of consumer drones, the Phantom 4s have a global shutter. Pretty much everything else has a rolling shutter oh, at the entry okay. level, except for their enterprise line is different. 
Other questions? Anyone on Zoom have a question? Yeah, Come there's on. one on Zoom. Any difference in overlap for grid or double grid pattern? I think it just depends on um, how much overlap you, you are going to need. So uh, if mechanical shutter is oh, another question, if a mechanical shutter is a global shutter, then Phantom 4 and Mavic Pro do have a global shutter. OK, thanks for the clarification, Mark. I think that's what Brandon um, also was indicating. Does um, Andy or Sean or Brandon, any difference in overlap for grid or double grid pattern? Sean is not here. Oh. <laughs> uh, my instinct would be not really. Uh, yeah. Brandon? I'll pass it. Can you say that again? Yeah. If you're doing any activities or trying to do a map of a structure, or anything that has a lot of vertical right. faces to it, then you're gonna to want to do the double grid pattern. Right. So you get the both the forward, back, left, right viewpoints to it. Right, that's right, great. Yeah, we do mostly landscapes, so but we don't do that, but that's a good addition. Okay, so not one more, seeing it. One more question. Okay, great. Oh. Mavic 2 Pro has a rolling shutter. Second point. Yes, Paul is also pointing out that some flight apps do have a mode where you can hover over each camera position, which kind of makes the rolling shutter not a problem. Ah, this is great. Terrific. Okay, so now we're going to get to the next part, which is the workflow. And this looks like a complicated slide. There's lots of software out there, and you guys are going to jump in um, shortly. There are some generic aspects to this workflow, and I'm going to walk you through this and then go through uh, some of the parts. So it all starts with that image collection, which is that collection of overlapping images that you've taken using your mission planning. You're also going to input the camera information that comes with each of those images. The software is going to try to find what are called key points. These are potential tie points. They're going to say, what are, where are all of the, in all of these images, what are little pieces of pixels that we can identify as being interesting? And then we're going to try to tie those together. The next step is we know a little bit about the camera, but again, the cameras aren't perfect and the drone is you know, flying, it it's, might be not perfect. So we're gonna calibrate, we're gonna do an equation to calibrate and decide where that those, the camera was actually at when it took the picture. From that, it's going to do this massive, these, are, these two squares are highlighted in yellow because this is the, the real guts of this whole process. It's gonna do this massive adjustment that ties all of those tie points together and produces some measures of um, how well these things fit. And this is the, st the step where you're gonna put in your ground control points if you have them. At this point, everything has an X, Y, and Z. So let's go up the top route. All of them have a point, have a, uh, you have a, all of your tie points have an X, Y, and Z. Now you can densify that and create that sort of point cloud. From that point cloud, you can classify it into ground and above ground and get your digital surface model and your digital terrain model. And from the point cloud, you can get your textured mesh. Let's go down this bottom route. After you do this block adjustment, you could also stitch all these images together and do an orthorectification process. There's some color balancing and seam matching that happens to get your ortho mosaic. And all of this process produces some kind of quality report that you can use to determine how well you've done. So the key points, these are what I mentioned before, the computer goes through and goes, where are likely things that are gonna stand out in every image? Massive numbers of these, of these key points. And these are just identifiable features, rocks, corners, boundaries, clusters, anything dis that's distinguishable in your imagery. And again, it's gonna depend on your ground sample distance, the visual context, your texture, your contrast, all sorts of things. From those key points, the software is going to try to find tie points. And these are key points that are the same 
in both images. And remember, they're, they're not like searching the whole image for this one guy. They know where this is because they have this sort of, you know, uh, early camera model that tells them uh, where to look for these things. And so this is a, just a panel from some PIX4D training. And you can see how that top panel actually might provide some pretty decent tie points because that's that same little bush, same little bush, same little bush. But you can see how these bottom two might be a little bit more tricky. They're textural differences, but they're not completely um, clear. And the bottom one, there's clearly little bits of, there's a bit of wind going on. And so the top might provide a, a, a nice tight tie point, whereas the bottom one might have a little bit more slop. But that's, that's really the process. Once, you've, once we've found all of these tie points, those go into this process, which is really the heart of it, this geolocation process. This, it's, so you're taking all of those individual tie points that you've seen, what's my location in all the different images, and the computer is trying to fit a big block adjustment to pull all those images together. And so based on how far it's gonna have to move each point, to get the overall solution, you're gonna be able to have a uh, root mean squared error for each of those uh, solutions. And so you can say, ah, this, this is a little bit too much. This is a little bit, has a little bit too much error. I'm gonna throw that out. But in general, you're creating a block adjustment across all those images that ties, that uses the relative information from all of those tie points to create a solution. And at this stage, all of those tie points now have an X, Y, and Z location. And that's important because the next step that we talked about is this point densification. And so you might decide you want to get a really robust point cloud out of this process. And you can choose this. You can ramp up your, your uh, point cloud density or dial it back a little bit. But again, as everything with drones, it's all about trade-offs. So the denser your point cloud is, it's gonna increase file sizes and, and um, processing time. I just give you a little snapshot there of a single tree. This is an almond tree in an almond orchard at, at uh, Lynn Cove. And so you're getting pretty dense um, points per square meter. This is, you know, you can densify between 100 to 150 points per square meter in this particular case, and that's way more than air, aerial LIDAR will give you. It's not as much as terrestrial LIDAR will give you, but it's still pretty dense. From that point cloud, you can create these digital surface models and digital terrain model. And again, the digital surface model is that skin on top of things. And the digital terrain model is the bare ground. And again, this is, takes advantage of the point cloud. It says, what's my ground? What's my not ground? And then creates a, a sort of a skin on top of it. Really quite, uh, quite useful products. You've seen these before. I show them in kind of vegetation settings, but you, you, know, you can get them in um, for buildings and everything else. It's the first, really the first return if analogous to, to LIDAR. And so uh, these are typically raster products, geotiffs or grids, and um, they're an automatic product of this workflow. As is the textured mesh, it's a triangulation of the densified point cloud and it has texture um, mapped back on to its surface. And there's lots of different, um, file formats that these things uh, will come in. An important next um, step, sort of the bottom of that workflow is creating your ortho mosaic. And a lot of you are, are very interested in this. And again, just a, a bit of definition, the ortho mosaic is different from just a stitched together image. The ortho mosaic is corrected and it utilizes that topographic information that was created in the previous step. And it's corrected for lens distortion, camera tilt, perspective, topography. And it basically reprojects the stitched into, uh, image into this really gorgeous product where distances are preserved, 
And then you can actually use this um, for measurements. The ortho, if you flew, um, you know, with a, a multi-spec, you can create NDVI or, or um, other uh, spectral indices, NDRE, but you can also do a lot with the visible images. I put this up just because you can get um, a spectral index VARI, visible um, atmospherically resistant index from an RGB camera. And of course, all of these indices make use of the spectral reflectance curve here shown um, on the right. And again, ortho mosaics are usually uh, geotiffs. After you've created all of these products, you will um, also receive all of the software will give you some kind of quality report that is going to be useful in, for you in helping to understand how well you've done. So the quality report typically tells you some basic information. How many images did you have? How many tie points were you used? What was your average root mean squared error? Uh, what's your uh, ground sample distance? It also gives you some details about those tie points and how well they fit. How many tie points are seen from two cameras, three cameras, four cameras, et cetera. It'll tell you some specifics about the error in those tie points in that block adjustment process. It'll tell you something about the camera, your ground control, and your information about overlap. And while um, I said there's some generic workflows, the actual quality reports from different software do look slightly different. So this is just an example from um, PIX4D. It's just sort of a snapshot. It, it'll give you general measures, you know, how many images, um, how many key points per image, uh, how many, what's your data set look like, how many images does it have, uh, how well did you do um, on the camera model fit, how well did you do on matching, something about your root mean squared error overall. So PIX4D, um, this is from ArcGIS Pro, and it's a different, part of the report here. I'm just showing you the sort of differences, but Esri does a good job on the mapping side. So in this case, it says here's where we initially thought the cameras were, because that's initially passed in at the very beginning. Here's where we tweaked it to, to show where the cameras actually were. And here's a map of, of overlapping images. And, and this is really you know useful because you can see that at your edges, you're going to have less overlap. And Becca mentioned this on day one. So you're always going to fly your mission study area larger than you want, because you're not going to get good matches um, at those edges, because you just don't have enough overlapping um, images. So some checks for you when you're done. You're going to look at your stitching metric, metrics and tie point results. You get this from the quality report. You want to look at your overlap results. I just showed you an example there from the quality report. You want to look at your relative spatial accuracy from your local information. You know, uh, look at, you know, does this line up? Is this tree, you know, in the right sort of relative place to, to another one? You also want to look at your absolute spatial accuracy, so how well it's tied to the ground. And you can do this from your quality port report looking at your root mean squared error. And then you want to do a gut check. You want to make sure this all looks right. Is straight straight? Are roads continuous? Do I have some weird disconnects in certain areas? You know, sometimes you'll you'll have a nice path and then there'll be a, um, a, st a step away. And so you want to, you know really interrogate this and see where you might have had problems with some local um, tie point adjustment. So practical aspects, we're, we're getting to the close here. Um, I, this is a spec from um, a while ago, but all of the software is gonna provide you some kind of guide to what sort of specifications you need to do this work and it, is in general pretty beefy needs. So you're gonna need um, a software and in general, they mostly are Windows, although I assume that's gonna be changing soon, but you really wanna um, beef up all of the stuff, you know, your, your graphics card your, and everything else and memory. So look up the software specs for the software that you're gonna be using and make sure you have enough. But in general, these, they can be 
quite slow. Some software slower than others, as you'll see. And this is a point about software. We're gonna work with a lot of different stuff today and most of it's gonna be on the desktop. And this is changing though. We are starting to get more options with software moving into the cloud. And there are enterprise options for processing drone data with some software like PIX4D. And so today we're gonna to talk with, we're gonna do uh, ArcGIS Pro, Open Drone Map, PIX4D and Drone Deploy. And most of those are gonna be desktop, but I think it's fair to say, stay tuned for um, more options um, in the cloud. Okay, that's it. So, so later on this afternoon, we've got PIX4D and Open Drone Map, and then Pro and Drone Deploy, and another uh, workshop on Pro. So, I'd love to take some questions. Thanks, Maggie. That's great. There's a couple questions in the chat. Maybe we can start with those. Yes, I can. So, um, so Matt, let me go up, make sure I'm getting, okay. So Max um, Vari, so Vari is cool. I just started working with this last year and it's a, it's by no means as good as NDVI because NDVI has near infrared and, and, and if we go back, let's see, near infrared is the real benefit for multispectral cameras because the green leaf um, pushes so reflects so much of it back into the uh, reflects so much back and so the NDVI is the difference between red and takes advantage of the difference between red and near infrared but if you don't have a multispectral camera and you're just working with um, visible light you can actually it's a kind of modified it's taking advantage of the green and the absorption in the blue and the red. And it actually does not bad. So this is an example of um, rangeland at Sierra Field Station. We were doing a, 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 just an experiment with visible cameras to look at um, enclosures and exclosures for rangeland. And you can see for relative difference in vegetation, it, it does a it does an okay job. And so there are lots of spectral indices out there. Obviously, the if you're dealing with vegetation, your best bet is a multispectral camera that has uh, near infrared as well as red edge. But you can do some stuff with um, visible light um, as well. Uh, do you have any thoughts? So Mark says, do you have any thoughts on relative quality between um, SW products, e.g. the output quality of drone deploy, oh, software products. The output quality of drone deploy seems better than easy maps. Don't know about software used in this class yet. This is a great question. And I, um, I, I don't know a short way to answer it, but I know there are differences because while this is a generic workflow, it isn't, isn't duplicative. So I would assume that there would be differences between them, but I haven't done a benchmarking test. Anybody else out there can comment? It's a good question. Uh, we can definitely come back to it by the end of the day when people will have a chance to play with some of these products. Does anyone have any knowledge idea. about benchmarking, comparing the outputs of different photogrammetry software? It, it is a topic of literature. Oh, that's a good point. There was a paper actually that just came out. Um, I will dig that up and put it in the community forum. Um, Karen Joyce, who is one of the uh, leaders in drone stuff, she actually did a benchmarking. I will find this and post it. Okay, we have about three or, or about four minutes to go, so we can get through a couple more. Um, I see in the chat, Max is asking about uh, what what type of flight would you do over oh. thick canopy and uh i would Sorry. say yes a double grid is probably a good good option because there's a lot of it's structurally complex because it's so three-dimensional and you need so to get to recreate that structure through the structure for motion you need a lot of look angles including look the other thing that we'll i i've done and others have done over thick canopy is don't do um point the camera a little off meter like maybe right. 75 degrees and again, that'll give you a some more images of, uh, you know, under underneath some of the leaves onto the stems and you just, you, you get a richer point cloud. I've had success with that. 
Yeah, it's it's true. Sorry, Max, I missed this earlier. And the point is, if you can't see it, if the camera can't see it on the ground, it's you're, you're not going to get it. So it's not a substitute for LIDAR. So LIDAR is an active sensor. It will pass through and you'll get multiple returns. But you can get, you know, LIDAR-like with um, more, more flying, more angles. All right, we have a couple of questions in the classroom. Okay, starting. Great. The question is, if you're estimating tree height, if that's your goal, do you need LIDAR or can you use a canopy height model from drone aerial photogrammetry? Absolutely, you can use, uh, can, you, can, you can get height. I mean, the height is the thing you can get from a tree because it's not occluded by anything else. I mean, that's, that's, the, you know, that's the whole basis of photogrammetry. If you can see the top of a tree, for multiple uh, vantage points, you can absolutely get the height of the tree and you can get that out from your uh, digital surface model. It's the okay. stuff underneath the tree that's less um, easy. All right, another question? Question is, what kind of flight considerations and mission planning considerations in an urban area where you're looking at structures uh, in terms of GCPs or any, any guidelines there? This is a branding question. I don't do any urban flying, but I, my first thing would be safety. And then GCPs would be, you know, they just can't be occluded, which is, um, uh, can be challenging in an urban environment. Yeah, let, let's pin that. Something else which is okay. challenging with photogrammetry in urban settings is parking lots don't have a lot of texture. So it's yeah. in the roofs of buildings. So it's, it's very difficult to stitch images. So maybe a little more overlap would be also warranted, but let's pin that and uh, we can ask for advice later. Okay, yeah, we have a... one time for maybe one or two more questions, Paul. Okay, there's still some in, in um, chat, but I'll... All right, uh, there's a comment here and then we'll take, yeah. Okay, so the comment is when you're flying over objects with a lot of vertical structure, like um, and light angle is something important and you may fly at different times uh, to get different different light angles. Yeah, this is great. And so light angle can be your friend and can it be your foe too. So we just did a, um, you can use it to get more texture, but you can also, you know, also think about if you're, so we are doing some stuff flying through the growing season, obviously the sun angle is going to be different as you move through the year. So yeah, sun angle can be helpful and it can also be um, a challenge. So Mark has a good question in chat. How yeah. do you deal with, with images that don't stitch well? Like if you do see discontinuities. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, this happened to us at, at Hoplin. Actually, we just redid it. We, we, I don't know. We redid it. The, so there, this could have been a benchmarking thing. Um, initially, the initial run had some roads that just weren't stitching together. And so we just pulled everything back out and um, did it again and paid attention to uh, where we actually had less overlapping images and um, yeah, just yeah. sort of. All of, all of the stitching software have options to like omit a certain photo and they give you different ways to see like what photos are, are not stitching well. Yep. So it's a laborious process, but if you do have, and if reflying the area is not an option, uh, they do have various options to, to go in and tweak your, but you, you basically have to restitch the image. You can't do much with the ortho mosaic that looks bad. Yeah. And let's take one more question and then we'll break here because here in the classroom, we do need time for people yeah, to of take course. a bio break and migrate to their classrooms. You want to pick one more question out of chat, Maggie? Um, stitching Locked. images from multiple flights, different times on the next day. I think that's kind of problematic. Um, and I don't uh, experience with surface rock types using RGB. I, I think this is another example where um, multi-spec is better, but I'm sure there's something you can get away with uh, with yes. RGB. I see people are nodding here. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Maggie. That was a great intro to the science. So let's take a 10 minute break. Does everybody know where they're going? Right, so PIX4D right next door, room 105 down the hall. Are uh, you people on Zoom? You might remember there's, I think PIX4D is gonna use the same Zoom line. And 
web odm will use the second zoom link if i'm not mistaken.